Hey everyone, I wanted to talk about heat treating steel a little bit in this video. So if you search for this topic on the internet, you'll find there's a lot of theoretical and background information, and then also a lot of uh, practical information without much explanation of why the things are done. So I'm hoping to bridge the gap a little bit in this video. When we talk about heat treating steel, we're mostly interested in increasing the material's strength by exposing it to different temperatures in sort of a prescribed way. Uh, but first a note about what strength actually is. There's a few different quantities to keep in mind here, um, the main ones being stiffness and strength. So here's a graph here, and it says strain on the bottom and stress on the uh, vertical axis. And what we're, what we're showing here is how hard we're pulling on the material here. The stress is the force divided by the area. And the strain is how far the material has moved. So this is the, the delta, how much the material has actually uh, elongated or contracted, uh, divided by its total length. So this graph takes into account whatever size material you might have. So for steels and most ductile materials, when we start yanking on the material, it will deform a little bit. And if we don't yank too hard, we can let go and the material will uh, elastically return back to its original shape. So if we take this steel bar here and I flex it a little bit, it snaps back to its straight shape with no problem. And so what's happening here on the graph is I'm taking it up to about this point and letting it back down. Instead, if I take this coat hanger and stretch it a little bit. Now when I let go, the, the curve actually stays in the coat hanger. So on the graph, what's happened is, is I've stressed it, so the stress has gone up, and eventually we've gone so far that it's gone past its yield point, and now we're in a region called the plastic region. So we put a plastic deformation in this coat hanger by bending it like this. What's important to note is that we can have a very stiff material that's not very strong, or we could have a very strong material that's not very stiff. The two quantities are actually not uh, dependent on each other. So let's pretend this line represented steel. Aluminum on this graph might look something more like this. And there's uh, a lot to talk about with this graph, but I'm just going to do sort of a general kind of overview. But hypothetically, let's say we had a, an aluminum alloy that looked like this. It, its strength could actually be equal to the steel. Now it's not going to be as stiff because the stiffness is actually a material property and we can't easily change the stiffness through heat treatment. We would probably have to use a different material if we needed a different stiffness. Um, but if we had this, this great aluminum alloy, we could say, well, it's just as strong as steel because the stress strain point where the material gives out and doesn't spring back anymore is actually at the same stress. However, the material has moved more in that, uh, in that loading because it's not as stiff. The X over here indicates the point of breakage. And so if we keep pulling this material farther and farther, eventually we're into this plastic region where we can uh, change the shape of the material without uh, putting in all that much additional stress. And then eventually the material gives out and it breaks. So when we heat treat steel, we're actually staying on this same slope here because we can't change the stiffness of it. But what we can do is move the yield point up through heat treatment. So let's just say we had a material that looked like this. Now this material is just as stiff as the original one. It's still steel, but it has a much higher uh, yield point, so we say that it's stronger. Um, one of the downsides, though, is that this line doesn't go over into the plastic region as far. So what happens with this material is we load it and it's still elastic, it's still elastic, and then there's a tiny amount of plastic deformation, but it breaks right away. Uh, this is characteristic of extremely hard steels, and it's also characteristic of uh, brittle materials, like glass. So if we took a, a piece of glass, just a, like a window, and flexed it, we could let go and it would snap back to its you know, flat shape. But eventually, if we flexed it too far, it would just break all of a sudden without really much warning. And we can't take a piece of glass and bend it and then let go and expect it to retain that shape. So glass is a brittle material because it doesn't have this plastic region.
You'll also note that it says maximum tensile strength here instead of here. So what's the deal with that? Like why, why do we actually count this as the material strength? Uh, the reason is that, let's say we were building like an airplane part or something that you wanted to support a load in an, in an important way. If the material is in this plastic region, the part has deformed enough where it might be causing problems. So let's say this were an airplane landing gear. If you're up in this region over here, the landing gear is not going to be the same shape anymore. So it's true that you might get a little bit of additional strength out of the material, but you really can't count on that part being sound anymore. So for engineering, this is the point where we say the material has failed, it's yielded. So the way to harden steel is to heat it up until it's glowing red and then very quickly reduce the temperature uh, by plunging it in water or oil typically. And what happens is, is the uh, crystal and structure inside the steel uh, changes, so it's very different from letting the steel cool down slowly. And that rapid cooling is actually what causes us to make the graph that looks like this instead of like this. But we have a problem. Uh, I just said that this is behavior is like glass, where you load the material and then suddenly it breaks really without much warning. And we don't really like that behavior in uh, very many materials. And another problem is that the really freshly hardened steel, like if you heat the steel up, dump it in water, take it out, it's so incredibly hard and uh, brittle that you can break it very easily, even with your hands if the steel, if the piece is small enough. So typically all hardening operations are followed by a tempering operation. And the tempering operation actually lowers the, the uh, strength of the material, but it increases the toughness. So there's a, a very distinct trade-off there. And the tempering process can be tailored to give us any sort of a, um, a strength versus toughness trade-off. So for example, let's say we tempered it so that we had a, a material that looked like this. Instead of going all the way to full hardness, we could temper the material and maybe we'd end up with something like that. So now we've got all this extra room here in the plastic region, uh, and it's not quite as strong as the, as the full hard, but the tempered steel is much, much more easy to use in an engineering application because it's not like glass, it's more like a, a, a normal metal. So to test this out, I bought some W1 steel. This is an eighth of an inch in diameter. And W1 means water hardening. So this steel is meant to be heated up and then tossed in water to quench it, to cool it down and harden it. And then you can temper it to, to give you any sort of a curve, uh, a desired toughness and strength. And to test it, I came up with this little test jig here so that I could load the samples in bending and carefully apply more load by hanging a bucket from it and I filled the bucket up with sand and bits of metal to see how much load I could hold with each, uh, with each piece of um, steel, with each sample. And what I did is I started off, these samples are untreated. So this is um, probably not fully annealed. Uh, when, we, when I talked about cooling the steel down, you have a couple options. You could heat it up to red hot and then cool it down really, really slowly by like putting it in an oven or in uh, an insulator and that will give you full anneal. That's the softest you can get. If you heat the steel up and just let it cool down in air, that's called normalized. And so even that will give you some amount of hardening over the uh, full annealed state. And I don't know how this is sold for McMaster. This is probably normalized. So they, they heated this up and then let it cool down at ambient temperature, I'm guessing. But it's, it's relatively soft. And so I was able to bend it like this just by applying uh, 16 kilograms. So note that we actually didn't get to breakage on this piece. What would happen to us is we went up the graph and then stopped somewhere around here. So it was plastic and eventually it just slipped out of the fixture. If we kept bending it, eventually we get to fracture and it would break. So next I tested one of these full hard pieces and this one I um, heated up to, you know, cherry red and then dropped it in water and took it out and put it in the, the loading jig. And this one only held six kilograms. And also, as you can see, there's no bending at the fracture. So that we have this sort of a, of a situation where it elastically deformed. You can see it bending a little bit when we load it. And then suddenly it fractures and snaps back. So there's very little, if any, uh, plastic deformation at the breakage point.
Now you might be saying, well, if this only held six kilograms and the soft one held, you know, uh, 16.2 kilograms, you know, what's the deal with that? I thought we were supposed to be getting a lot more out of this. And the answer is that uh, point loading is a very complex thing. And so if we have a bar like this with a, a steel cable loading it like this, right at the point where the steel cable is touching it, there could be an additional stress caused by this loading scheme. Uh, this is also the reason that glass is not considered a structural material because you can't really clamp a piece of glass without introducing a lot of local stresses that would break it. So you can really think of super hard steel like this as a piece of glass where it's very, um, it's very touchy and so small, small amounts of, of local stress will cause it to, fra to fracture, which is why it's basically never used. So now we've covered the extreme ends of this spectrum. We've gone from normalized or very soft to full hard, which is almost unusable because it's just so brittle. So to temper the steel, what we do is we heat it up a little bit and then let it cool down slowly. And what happens here is we, we give up some of this hardness because we're letting some of that crystalline structure change by heating it up a little bit. And if we heat it up to a very specific temperature, we can control how much strength we're actually trading for toughness. Uh, very conveniently, steel will change color in air based on how, uh, how high we heat it up. And the color change comes from an oxide layer that's forming on the steel, and it's interfering with light. And we can see what color or what temperature the steel is based on what color we see off of that, because the oxide layer is forming a, an optical interference pattern there. So as we heat it up, we'll uh, see a straw yellow color, and then kind of an orange color, and then brown, and purple, and then blue, and then light blue. And the hotter we heat it up, the more uh, strength we give up in return for getting more toughness. And so there's quite a bit of research and uh, fine tuning to be done here, but for home shop hardening and tempering, it's actually quite an effective and um, uh, decent means of, of setting up tooling. Of course, if you have access to a kiln, it also makes a lot more sense to just set the temperature that you want to temper your steel to and put it in the kiln and leave it for the prescribed time, which is actually like an hour or two usually, and then take it out of the kiln and let it cool down. So interestingly enough, I started with the, the 300 degree Celsius piece that I uh, kiln tempered, and this piece held about 55 kilograms. In fact, my bucket became overloaded. I put all of the sand in there, and that it was holding fine. And then I put all kinds of random scrap bits of metal in there, and it was still holding, and I had to push down on it with my arms. So I, I completely didn't expect how strong I could actually make this steel compared to the full hard and the uh, normalized state. Uh, the results for the other tempered pieces were pretty similar, except for this one. This one I tempered only to straw yellow, which is uh, less tempering, which means more brittle and uh, stronger. So I, I stopped recording how much weight these things held because my system was woefully inad inadequate. But what was interesting is that this one broke uh, in a brittle sort of a fracture, uh, whereas these other tempered pieces that were tempered to higher temperatures did not break like that. Uh, these yielded. Another really handy trick is to use a file to determine how hard the material is that we're working with. So these normalized pieces, if you just lightly run a file along it, I'm hardly pressing down on the file, I'm just pushing it along very gently, you can see that it sort of grabs. And after you do this a few times, you'll get a very good feel for what different steels um, act behave like. But this is very grabby. And if we take one of the full hard pieces, the, the file just absolutely glides along like it's on glass. It's not even biting into the material at all. And that's because this is actually harder than the file. So when we drag the file teeth across there, <clears throat> the teeth don't dig into the metal at all. Whereas with a softer one, the file teeth actually bite in and that's what's causing the drag. Also, I should point out that um, hardness is related uh, to strength. So when we say a material is really hard, what we mean is it's actually very strong. And files are quite hard. It's actually one of the hardest tools that you'll find in a, a common machine shop. And the fact that we can run it across this, and this is actually even harder than the file, seems, would indicate that this is something that, this is a hardness that you generally not encounter.
Here's a graph that shows what's actually happening when we cool down a piece of steel. So this is the first part of the process, the hardening part of the process, and we've got temperature on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And we're starting off at about 800 degrees C, which is the um, cherry red color. And what we want to do is get down into this phase down here. We want to get below this line without going through this part of the graph. So this whole deal with cooling it down quickly is because we need to get down to this part of the graph without interfering with this area. This graph is called the time temperature uh, transformation graph and we talk about going past the nose of the TTT graph like this. And so there's this critical cooling rate where we have to get down into here uh, or else we don't get this hardening effect. So if we take too long, if we, if we spend 10 seconds cooling down from 800, we're going to end up in this region. And that means that um, we'll get some hardness, that there'll be some hardening effect, but it won't be anywhere near getting down to here. And if you're curious, the M is martensite, which is the crystalline structure that gives us that really high hardness in steel. When we temper the steel, we're actually starting out down here and we take it up into this region. So we're basically giving up some of this really hard crystalline structure and gaining some of this less hard but uh, tougher structure. And there's a lot of terminology involved here that probably won't help you understand it, but if you go searching for this stuff, you'll find quite a depth of information. So you might be wondering, well, can I do this trick with a coat hanger if I uh, heat it up and then cool it down and do this sort of transformation? Uh, no, the answer is nope. You need to have steel that is hardenable, and not all steels are hardenable. And the thing that determines whether they're hardenable or not is the uh, carbon content and, to a lesser extent, the other alloying ingredients. So this W1 water hardening steel that I've been using today has a carbon content uh, fairly close to 1, 1%. So this graph shows us temperature on the y-axis and carbon content as a percent on the x-axis. And most tool steels are pretty close to about 1%. And the reason for that is that it, it makes this crystalline structure that's very beneficial for having a very hard structure. If we have tons and tons of carbon, what we actually have is cast iron. And if we have very little carbon, we have cheap steel, basically. <laughs> okay, well, I hope that was helpful. See you next time. Bye.